Welcome to Fashion Revolution. We are discussing our business today and Karen Gelbert has been really kind to offer to share her 30 years of experience working at fairs and, and expos and things like that. Um, so welcome back, Karen. Great to see you again. Thank you. Uh, Great. And you write, you wrote up some wonderful notes. So do you want to just start with those or do you want to start with my burning questions? Well, actually, this is the point. You know, um, I'm happy to share my advice because you are part of my tribe. <laughs> We're happy We're to be part friends. of your tribe. <laughs> <laughs> the hard thing about advice, though, is that people have already decided what they want to do, and it's hard to listen to advice. So I think that the first thing I should do is ask what you really want to know. And after that, I'll follow up with my 600 words or less about the core things you need to know about doing art fairs. So tell me, what do you really want to know? Well, I think that most of us are at a phase in what we're doing in our careers where we're trying to figure out what kind of business we want to be. And for me personally, I have to go and do a few art fairs and discover whether or not it's really right for me before I decide whether that's a, a business arm to invest in, right? So so for me, it's finding out, right? Like, and I, I think for Elena, it's a little bit that way too. Um, for somebody like Maria, who's, whose focus is on doing uh, New York Fashion Week and runway shows, um, this is like, oh, have you explored this? Because this might actually be another way to uh, foster clients and stuff like that. So we don't know. It seems my background is consulting, so is a service business. So this product business model is all new and different to me. So I, I don't know if that tells you. What I want to know is, is it right for me? I don't think you can answer that, but you can tell us a bunch of like what the cost is of doing it, what the tools are to do it well, what you hope to, what's reasonable to hope to get out of it. Um, it's more like, hey, I don't think we actually have that many expectations or ideas yet. We're, we're looking at it for the first time. We did our first street fair last weekend. It was a ton of fun. I wouldn't say it was terribly profitable. There were three of us there. We were there for how many hours, Elena? Oh, she's here. You, Elena. Yeah. <laughs> Show was itself was like four, so I would say we were there for probably six. Yeah, you know? and how many yeah. how many people do you think actually stopped at our booth and talked to us during the course of the day? Actually, a decent amount for how small the for how yeah, small. Yeah. So it was. how many how many is a decent amount? I would okay. Guess. So yeah, like. 20? 20 to 30 people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three of us for 20 to 30 people. So, <laughs> so that's what we did. Um, and, and it was a milestone for us to move forward and have our first and set up an awning and get tables and put our merchandise out. Some of it was labeled with prices. Some of it wasn't. So it was a milestone and it was a great community bonding thing. But financially, it's 100% not worth it to have three people for six hours and 20 to 30 visitors. And I think I sold uh, $80 worth of merchandise. Uh, wait, more than that, because the auction came through too. So that maybe $120 worth of merchandise. So, and that's, that's the selling of not the making. <laughs> that's not profit. That's just, so that's ridiculous. Uh, but we don't know that it's always like that. I, I mean, you've done it. You must find a way to make it profitable. So tell us about that. Well, um, the first of all, I really don't like to do one day shows and it, I'm not even fond of two day shows. And why? Because there's so much effort to get there, set up and tear down. I want it up for three days. <laughs> okay. So that's a good first tip is not to, not yeah. to even do one day shows, but to look for something that has... Um, for the amount of effort to set up yeah. you, you, and tear down, you don't have to work as long. So. so you really need to visit these shows first to figure out if you think that you're a good fit. Is your product going to be a good fit? If you're going to do a farmer's market, your price point's going to need to be lower and you may not even have product that will qualify 
to be in a farmer's market. Um, I'm not sure how you found your local street fair. Maybe it was a, a neighborhood event. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, my first one was in a church basement, so it was a church bazaar, um, and they wanted me to come and demonstrate, so I brought my loom and my spinning wheel, and you know, I spent more time demonstrating than I did selling. Uh-huh. So you start to learn these things. Um, I should mention that uh, my folks, in the height of their success of their life, they had better quality women's retail stores. So Uh I always had an image in my head about what that presentation should look like. And that goes into what my booth is going to look like, you know, trying to create that perfect environment where you can display your work and people can have access to it. You've got hang tags, you've got information, you've got mirrors, All of that was part of, you know, designing my presence in my 10 by 10 booth. Uh, But finding the right art fairs takes some work. I think it was good that you started with a community event. Um, I think there's a lot that you you make those connections and you realize that maybe you need something that's a little different, a little bigger. And if you're in the Seattle area, you might consider the Best of the Northwest or Northwest Art Alliance as a group. Um, that's local, but a little larger. Um, There are a couple resources I'm aware of that are good to look at to do your homework to find out where you want to go. One of them is a website called artfairinsiders.com. They list art fairs all over the country, and they're different level of art fairs, um, juried and, and under. Uh, fine craft, fine art, or just craft or renaissance or just a variety of of shows. Um, Zap Application is my go-to website for applying to juried art shows. Um, I started out with a church bazaar, but I've really, my goal was to make money, was to get to the bigger metropolitan cities to market my work. And the best way for me to do that as I've worked my way through success and failure of applying was to really aim high, aim for the very best shows. They're organized to support the artist, connect with their community and make sales. And um, I did homework about uh, the, the average income in some of these neighborhoods, just looking to see, you know, is this where I need to go? These are some of the same decisions you would make if you had a brick and mortar retail store. You know, where are you going to locate? Who's going to be walking by who might have the pocketbook who can afford my artwork? Can you give us like a financial snapshot on what uh, one of the better jury shows is likely to look like? Like, what does it cost to do it? What does it cost in terms of your time? Or do you have an assistant? Do you travel there yourself? How much um, sales do you usually anticipate having and, and what, just like a little financial snapshot? Well, um, again, you know, I kind of aim high. You can spend anywhere from $150 for a booth space to $1,200 for a booth space, depending on which show and your venue. And uh, that's just for the privilege of a 10 by 10 space on the floor. Uh-huh. So you have to come up with a a plan or a rule of thumb is that you want to make three and four times your initial investment for the booth space. You want to make three and four times that in sales. And this doesn't necessarily factor in everything, all your expenses about getting there. That's going to vary. But if you're just starting out, start close to home so you can sleep at home. When you start adding hotel costs, restaurant costs, parking costs, your costs go up. Um, so if we're going to back up here and talk about having a small business. Yeah, I, I'm jumping. My brain yeah. is jumping around as you talked about travel. Let me, let me just, just, just yeah, yeah, back yeah. up here. Okay. <laughs> if you want to have a small business, if you make more than $600 a year, you're going to have to pay taxes. Just know that. And in most states, you're going to have to collect sales tax. So you need to be set up to have a separate checking account that's dedicated 
to your small business. It's a business checking account, not a personal account. Then you need to have credit references from the companies you buy supplies from, then you pay your bills on time. So you can apply for a credit card merchant account. 95% of my sales are done by credit card, not cash. So it, you need to be set up as a business to be able to accept credit cards. Um, it's a lot easier now when you have services like PayPal available. Um, and now there's even a Venmo business model. But it's very important to keep this out of personal checking and accounting and dedicated to your business. With your credit card, if you track your expenses for materials, supplies, and all the other things that you do for your small business, you start to get a record of what it costs to have your business. And that will help factor in what you need to charge for your work. It's not just about, oh, I had this fabric for 10 years, so I don't have to, you know, I don't have to charge for that. And I had these buttons and I had this thread. No, you really need to account for your cost and also factor in your design time, your expertise. Your, your time is not free. So already, you, you might be happy that you sold something for under $100, but that may not really have been a good price. But when I was starting out, I was pleased that I was just covering my material costs and I could reinvest that and buy more materials. But I was still finding my way. You know, I, doing my first art fair was probably, uh, might have been the Salem Art Fair, which is the oldest art fair in Oregon. It's in a park. Um, and I remember that I had a tent that had a white top, but I didn't have sidewalls. And so I had to go out at that time and find white tarps and bungee cords to create the walls for the tent. And uh, now I have uh, I quickly realized that it looked pretty tacky. So it's just like, it's a journey. You start with not having anything and you find your way to finding all the appropriate things. But if you want to jump in and do it right, then you look at people who you admire in your field and look at their websites, look at the shows that they apply to, study them. They are your peers. How do they do it? What do they use? And you start to accumulate the knowledge that will work for you, pick and sort through it. One of my favorite um, things that I like to do was to go into Portland and even in Seattle, and browse through the discarded or used retail display fixture stores. I don't know if they're still in business. I know the one in Portland finally closed, but it was just like a candy store. Yeah, to yeah me. what's this could, called? I've never heard of this, so I totally want to find the retail well, it, display. You just, you just Google used retail display fixtures. Okay. And there used to be a place under the bridge in Seattle. Grand and Benedict's is the go-to resource for new retail display fixtures. Because for the, for the wearable people, we have to figure out a way to display our work in the booth. Uh, if you're a painter, you might have pro panels and you hang your work on the gray walls and it all very looks like a gallery. It's nice and clean. For wearables, we actually have to come up with a display system that will hold the weight of the garments. Um, and it gets a little harder. Uh, I think I'm jump, jumping ahead of myself, but let me let me step back. Well, they're, they're, you don't have to go in any order. This is a conversation, so you know. <laughs> and we can repeat and all that kind of stuff. You know. So, all right. Let's say you want to do an art fair and you need a tent. What are you going to do? Oh yeah. So, what kind of tent is good to get? That's what I want to know. Because we, well, Ellen and I, took how long to put that one down? What kind of tent did you have? Can't hear you. Can't hear you. You're muted, Ellen. I, there was a trick to it, and we kind of, I, I don't know about you, but I totally injured my thumb muscles trying to get that dang thing down. But um, eventually, when we figured that out. I think it took us 40 minutes to figure it out. At least. 
Yeah, and then I it think took so. about five minutes once we so figured it out. So was it an yeah. easy up canopy? Or yeah, it... and it yeah. was an older blue one that my parents had that we could oh, borrow. No, 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 no. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's chuckling at us. <laughs> okay. Well, it was free, right? Yes. Yeah, free. <laughs> <laughs> and I had some display racks that don't collapse at all that we had to jerry rig into the back of her van in my car. <laughs> they were awesome, though. They're yes, strong. you've got it. You, you've already jumped into all of those issues. Um, number one, you don't want a blue top on your tent because it affects the light in the booth. Mm-hmm. You want a white top. Juried art festivals require that you have a white tent, not blue or pink or any other color, but white. Then the other thing is that you want a tent that meets the fire marshal requirements. A fire marshal can shut down a show if someone has um, curtains or tents or an open flame in any tent. It will close the entire show and everybody will be mad at you for that. So you really need to um, kind of follow the rules and guidelines that any of these shows should give you when you apply. But the fire marshal code is very important. So no more open flames, Elena. Yeah, dang it. <laughs> I just want to do a fire dance. No. <laughs> Where are we going to put our fire spinners now? Uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> Those um, are the shows we need. No. That, also, that also applies to whatever electricity you might have running to your booth. All of okay. those things are very important. And there are, okay. you know, the show should give you an an application listing what those things are. But the fire marshal is either, he's a, he's keeping us safe and he has a hard job to do. It has been um, my experience to see a fire marshal walk into an indoor show, take out his lighter and hold it in front of the curtain that was displayed in the booth. And if that curtain starts to uh, catch fire and not melt, he will find that person in the booth for having a flammable material in the display. Oh, this and is so sad have... because we're really fully against plastics here in the like eco world. <laughs> um, and so I, I have uh, drapes in my booth and I'll, I'll tell you why it's important to have drapes in your booth, but we'll get to that. This is more advanced knowledge here. Um, I'm excited about this. But th- there are, um, the convention centers rent something called pipe and drape if you're doing the inside shows. All of those meet fire marshal code. So I decided to purchase my own uh, drape from a company whose business is exhibition hall drapes. And I use something called banjo cloth. It meets, it has a tag on it, says that it's flame proof. Um, I love it because it's the color I need as a backdrop. It's uh, fairly uh, indestructible as far as being wrinkle proof. I can roll it up, stick it in the suitcase and off we go to the next show. But I am also, um, I'm I'm meeting the code. So it's not an issue for me. So it's called banjo cloth and it's particularly made as exhibition hall drape. And it comes in a wide variety of colors. So if this is the standard for convention halls, this is where I need this is something I need to have. Uh, Later on, I purchased a booth that would work both indoors and out. So my one-time investment in a good booth meant I didn't have to pay for the pipe and drape every time I did an indoor show. So when I, does that make sense to you? Yeah. So instead of using pipe and drape indoors now, you have a, a tent that you can use inside as well. Right. The top comes off and that's what you have to do for an indoor show. Oh, okay. Um, uh, And what kind of investment for like a real quality booth? Like if you were going to be doing a lot of professional affairs, like you are, you said it was one time investment a couple thousand or. Yes. Yeah. You're looking at a couple thousand. Definitely. Um, My first tent was $500. It was steel and it it was those uh, joints with the big screw on them. And you could just kind of like tinker toys, design whatever you needed but the structure for the top had to be peaked. Oh, okay. And those aren't even available anymore. Yeah. The easy ups um, have come a long way, but from there are some art fairs that will not allow them at all. 
they are the easy, they are easy to go up, they're easy to go down in bad weather. If it rains, the water will pool in the top of the tent and collapse the accordion metal stuff uh, so that the tent just falls inward. Uh, and you either have to stand there all night and push the water off the top of the tent and that water goes flying into your neighbor's booth and they get mad at you. So I think the easy up is a real problem. Uh, now, Costco does offer a couple other easy up style booths uh, that are heavy duty. There's one called Euromax I've heard about. Um, I guess, again, the advantage is that it is an accordion style where you, it, it comes as a bundle and you open up the legs and pop up the tent and supposedly that's easier. The point for me though, since I do wearables is that I really needed a booth that would support the weight of my garments and the display systems. One of the go-to display systems are Gridwall. Are you familiar with Gridwall? They are two feet wide and they come in various heights, uh, six, seven feet tall. There are some components that are smaller and shorter. Uh, there are interlocking uh, waterfall devices for hanging several garments. And the lovely thing is that once you get the grid wall and some of the um, devices that hook into it, it seems like you, you've got it made. You've got your store right there. So again, I look at Grand and Benedict's display fixtures. They are both in Seattle and in Portland. Um, online, there's a couple resources I also use. One's called retaildisplay.com. They sell all parts. Did you and, say and Grand pieces. or Brand and Benedict's? Grand and Benedict's. They're two different or Grand and Benedict's is one? It's, it's the name of their company is two words, Grand and Benedict's. Okay. And B N I Ben Dix. Dix. -E yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what was the last one? You said Gridwell, Grand and Benedict's. Um, uh, Displayfixture.com. Okay. Retaildisplayfixture.com. Oh, okay. And you'll find others. You know, th they abound <laughs> out there. Uh, they sell mannequins, they sell display fixtures, they sell rolling racks. Um, uh, and er I think everything that you might need think that you need. So I needed a tent that I could use that would hold my, my grid wall. When it's so, not easy up, is it, is it still something that you can manage by yourself? You know, it just uh, takes okay. a little longer. Well, I chose not to get an easy up. I okay. never liked the way they look. Didn't I didn't like, like okay. the risk. Right. So I purchased something they call a U-line. It's made out of al aluminum. It's lighter to carry all the pieces. And it was designed, supposedly, so you could set it up yourself. Oh, okay. The, the poles are telescoping with a, a button that snaps. Uh -huh. Yes, you do have to work out. Use your thumbs, and sometimes you can pinch it. But I thought it was... Um, a stronger system for supporting the weight of my garments. Uh -huh. So There's your garments an, hang right off of the edge of the, huh? Ah, uh, well, we'll get to this. Okay. Hold on, hold on to that thought. Okay. <laughs> there is another tent company that other artists like as well. It's called a Flourish. They design a tent called Trimline. So I think that Trimline and the light dome are the two most frequently seen tents at the juried art fairs that I do across the country. If you make the initial investment in an easy up and find out that your show won't even allow them, that should be a clue to you that was the wrong choice. If you well, just, we, that's why we're talking to you now. We don't want to put $500 <laughs> into a booth that we can't use. Right. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to offend the easy up people. There is a place for their tents, you know, that, that it's important that they make them. And there are events where that's just the right kind of tent. Typically, like your first takes, street fair with 20 people. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, it takes me four hours to unload my tent, display fixtures and garments and set up my total display. 
in the beginning, as a younger woman, I did all of this myself. As I got older, I have two replaced knees now. I found it harder to do the heavy lifting. So I turned to my friends and my family, who I have now um, exhausted. <laughs> so you really want to go into it thinking, I'm going to do this myself. Okay. Every aspect of this is that you should be able to do this yourself. Okay. Well, I learned from another older female artist at another art fair that what her solution was, and I really liked it. She hires temporary workers to come in to unload the truck, assist with setup, and then return on Sunday night for teardown. She was 10 years older than I was, and I thought it was a great idea. So there is a staffing agency all across the country called People Ready. I set up an account with them as a business. And when I arrive in that city, I use their app and I request helpers. I have to make a list of the activities that they are going to do. Have to be able to lift 50 pounds or more. Have to come prepared to work with appropriate um, garments and shoes um, and see what else they have to do. They have to stay for the entire setup and tear down. They can't just leave. <laughs> uh, they have to be able to feel comfortable climbing a short ladder. They have to be able to use a drill um, or uh, zip tie cutters. I mean, I just made a list of the activities that were involved. They have to be able to do work with their arms above their heads such as getting the light fixtures up in the tent. All of those were, I just had to analyze the tasks and have them do the steps, which saved me. So they helped with the hot, sweaty part. <laughs> and I think I've only had one experience when someone didn't show up. So I, you are required to hire them for a minimum of four hours. That's just part of the contract. But the good thing about using people ready is that these are people who need to work. They have been vetted by a company. The company covers the liability. This is, again, very important so that you're not sued if they get injured. Um, and also the company might take a piece of the action as far as the fee, but they are providing a service for me. And I'm really happy to be helping someone who might otherwise be having a hard time finding a job. So I hire them at four hours in the beginning for setup and four hours Sunday night for tear down. And, and when you're looking at the cost of um, the booth um, and trying to make uh, four, three to four times that back, the fee of your support, is that included in your thinking that you want three well, that is that is one of the other costs that go into the, okay. those fees. So I'm, I'm probably spending 90 to $100 each time I hire someone. But I'm also providing work for those who need it. That's really cool. I, I love this recommendation too on the company having a specific one to look to and that it's as easy as having an app. And I figure once you've made that list of, of setup tasks that it's the same thing every time. So you can just copy and paste it. it can yes, I actually quick. have a uh, show notebook. I think I just put it away since I, oh, as, as uh, the other guests may, may not have heard, it's kind of been a difficult week for me this week because I canceled all of my shows. I had shows, four shows in four states in the month of September, but due to COVID-19 risks and the fact that I have autoimmune issues, I made the very hard decision to cancel my shows. Um, this is kind of gut-wrenching because I was planning on um, being able to return to work and make the money that I need to make by doing these shows. Will you be able to do some of these shows virtually? Let's talk about virtual shows for a little bit, because I, I feel like that's a whole new area with COVID as part of our reality now. Um, oh, but I just want to stop and say hi to Mercedes. I know we said hi to Elena, but it's great to see you here, Mercedes. And feel free to jump in with questions at any time. Hmm. 
Um, yes, many of the shows last year figured out how to go virtual, and I was just thrilled that they did. You know, each of them approached it different ways. Some were. Um, yeah. What do you it think was, has worked best in terms of what you've seen people do? Um, what has worked best for you virtually? It hasn't worked that well, except for the fact that your presence is still out there. That is important. You don't, you, it is a kind of advertising, if you will, because you are trying to support the shows. Um, you've not just fallen off the edge and disappeared. I really applaud those shows who have found a way to build the platforms because they've discovered that they're going to continue using them. The virtual art fairs have um, widened their audience. What they have to maybe learn to do better is to get the audience there. And that's a discussion, I think, for um, another time about how to do that and how to make it work. I do have some thoughts about it. I think that if so with it was the, on, uh, with the virtual ones, the main problem you've seen is that they're not actually attracting an audience to your work. Is that what you're people, saying? You haven't seen no, the no, sales. No, no. People don't know what's happening. They don't remember to uh -huh. go visit the website. Uh -huh. So I think if it was on the local cable TV show, that people might remember. Uh -huh. They just need to have it in front of them to remember to visit the site. The other disadvantage of uh, the virtual shows is that some shows you have to upload your inventory to the show and they, they run the sales. And that's a little easier. It's harder on the artist because you've got to get all that information uploaded to their website. Uh, inventory stuff is not something we do easily. Um, it's images and writing all the information. And then, of course, they get a percentage so the other model was that people would go to the virtual art fairs, but to make a purchase from an artist, they had to go off of the initial web website to the artist's website, do the transaction, and then they have to go and return to the virtual art fair, and that's when you usually lose them. So yeah, there, yeah. there are some... some issues you, there. Did any of the virtual... Um shows have a teaching venue in which you you were more prominent and did that make a difference or oh they did interviews um they asked us um, this is part of my journey last year is they asked us to do short videos of us working in our studio well i you know last year i'd have to say i didn't know really how to do that had never really thought about doing that because i'm too busy working in my studio i've gotten um fairly good now um of, for making short videos. And I've given it a lot of thought about how to represent my wearable art through short videos. I now have a YouTube channel. If you want to take a look at it, it's under my name, Karen Gelbart. Oh, I've already checked it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, awesome. I've become yeah. a student of how am I going to show these people how these garments feel? You know, how does it flow? How is it, you know, what can it look like? How can I how can I communicate the message that I live in the Pacific Northwest and it's, you know, it's behind the inspiration for the work that I do. And so you're going to see that in my YouTube channel videos. Um, we can talk about that another time as well, but going back to art fairs, I got to get down to some of these nuts and bolts here. Um, you need to have a white tent, need to make, meet the standards for the fire marshal. The other thing is that tent can be a little oven in the hot sun. I've done a lot of shows where it's over 100 degrees. And people, there are art fair artists who suffer from heat stroke because they're in those white tents and it's like an oven. So I've come up with some strategies. I looked for a tent that is UV protecting and the top and the material they use for the top. That helps. But for me, since I am very sun sensitive, since I have lupus, I have taken um, oh, sunshade material in white, same color as my tent top, and I put it over the center portion of my tent, down the center, but it's about four feet wide and 10 feet long, 10 feet, no, it's 12 feet long. Uh, I needed the 12 feet because of the pitch of the tent. 
but that pr provides one more level of sun protection for me, but leaves the side walls uh, with the regular tent coverage for light. And that's where my garments hang. So I had to do that. And there are some art fairs where I've taken one of those um, reflecting materials they use for, for heat, shiny side. I put that on the very top of the tent. I did that when I was in Idaho because the sun was just unbearable. I actually, I had two of them and shared it with another artist because he was just about to collapse from heat stroke. So you put that up, it reflects the heat out of the tent and changes the temperature within that tent. So these are survival strategies. For I'm just going to put on my list of research on street fairs is how hot <laughs> is it like to be in the season that it's happening? Because well, I actually, am not sitting anywhere at 100 not, degrees. Not, like only, that, not only do I look at the demographics of various cities as far as income level, I also look at the average temperatures. Yeah, see, you, you got me there. I'm for sure on that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Missouri, Utah, Idaho. Um, what am I leaving out? Omaha, Nebraska was probably the worst. Yeah. All right. So we're talking about heat, but the other issue is there also can be rain. So if you're going to have a tent, you need to have a tent with walls that will zip up and secure. <clears throat> and if you're going to talk about a rain, you need to talk about wind. Now, if I'm going to do an outdoor show, I need to have 100 pounds of weight for each leg of the tent, 100 additional pounds of weight. This is not a bucket of water. This is 100 pounds for each leg of the tent. What kind of um, weights do you use? Well, initially, I got the PVC pipes, filled them with sand or concrete, and uh, put an eye bolt on the top and used straps to hang it from the top of the frame. But that was not enough weight. My second strategy after doing the Utah Arts Festival, uh, they, they were just brilliant. They'd had a microburst at an art fair one year where th this sudden storm came up, went over the top of the city buildings, straight down and flattened the artist booth. It would happen to be a glass artist at the time. And all the easy ups were just tumbleweeding down the art fair. This was a true terrible disaster. So they went to some research people and came up with the strategy where they moved these 200 pound concrete boulders between each of the art fair tents that had eye bolts in them that we could strap into. After they did that, no art fair tent was tumbleweed down the art fair. It was, it was a wonderful strategy. I'm not sure why other art fairs haven't done it, but Salt Lake City in particular had um, reoccurring microbursts. So they just figured it out. So I got the bright idea that next time I went to a big city and had uh, a tent, there was often an exhibition tent company working with the art fair. They're the ones that set up the stages. They set up the uh, sponsor booths. So I went to them and I said, I'd like to rent some concrete for my booth. They come deliver it and they take it away at the end of the show. But that meant I didn't have to carry 400 pounds of weight in my vehicle cross country. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally, 100%. Okay, so not every, comp not every art fair that was going to happen. So my second recourse is to go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a bag of pea gravel. They come either in a 50-pound bag or sometimes they're smaller bags. I needed the smaller ones. The 50 pounds was a lot to lift. So I got some... Um, sandbags from Home Depot, divided up the pea gravel. And I used uh, 100 pounds of pea gravel for each of the leg of the tent and draped it over the stay bars that are the lower bars in the tent. The stay bars go on the three lower legs of the tent. Um, stay bars are important too. Um, pea gravel is a great resource. Now, I happened to be in Peoria on the riverfront, and they had a tornado alert. Not one tornado alert. They had two tornado alerts. 
We had five minutes to get out of there, zip up your booth and leave. I had those bags of pea gravel holding my booth on the brick pavement. So there's no way to, you know, stake in. You really had to exist with the sheer weight of your booth to withstand the storm. Now, there's no reason that my booth should have remained standing in that storm. Um, it did. Everything got, you know, there was all kinds of rain and water to deal with, but my booth hardly moved. So you have to think about the weather. And when you set it up, you plan for the most extreme weather. So I have yeah. a, a couple of questions. Um, so with, with all this thinking about the booth and making it um, your, is it your main point of sale for your business? Um, are the, the fairs, is that where you do 80 or 90% of your retail? Yeah. I, um, my and how many do you typically do in a year? How many um, street fairs? Well, it has changed over the years. And, and you know, numbers are going to be different for everybody. And what a person's expectation is different. But when I do the St. Louis Art Fair, it's typically I do $12,000 in a weekend. Wow. And that doesn't count the orders that might follow. Uh-huh. But there are some shows when you just barely make three thousand, uh -huh. and that's it's like a thousand dollars a day was my rule of thumb in the beginning, to help you know cover the cost of doing the show and my expectations to be making enough. If I made less than that, it wasn't my show. I shouldn't be there. And about how many shows a year? I I still am curious, like one um, or two a month, or in like in the beginning. I probably only did, you know, two or four shows a year. Then it grew to eight. Then it grew to 12. But one year I did 18 shows. And that was way too many. It was hard to keep up with the making of, of what I needed to make and do that much traveling. And when I started looking at the expensive, I real it was really better for me to target the better shows and have less travel. This year, I think I only have six shows. Um, two were virtual on my slate, and I've just canceled four of them. So I, I, I have some things to figure out this year that, you know, it's, it's a huge disappointment to me to not have that connection of the shows. The shows do a tremendous job of getting people to the venue. People want to support their communities by coming out for these local events. And uh, I have developed a relationship in various places in, in different towns with the people who come looking for what's the new thing that I have this year. So um, yeah. Karen, I don't I don't know if you're seeing the chat, but Mercedes just say um, wow, that's awesome. I didn't realize so much went into putting a booth up. Thank you for all your ideas and input. <laughs> yeah, She's just being well, shy I'm instead of you. jumping in. She tends to be very incognito with her microphone <laughs> on mute and stuff like that. <laughs> well, I, certainly, I certainly don't mean to scare anybody off about this. This is hard to do, but it is, you know, the thing that I like about it is there are many women out there as artists who are doing this. And each of you are going to find your own display system to do, to do what you need to do that will work. Um, one of my criteria was that everything needed to fit into my vehicle. And you really need to look at what your vehicle is. What's its capacity? Um, for many years, I had to lay my garment bags down in the back of the minivan. And uh, I am very happy to say later in my career, I finally was able to purchase a Sprinter. It's the smaller one, but it's still a Sprinter. And I have welded a, um, a rack in the, down the middle of the cargo van where I can hang all my garment bags. They're no longer laying down. One of the things I found with my Chrysler minivan is that I often had to replace my shock absorbers because I had too much weight in the vehicle. You put your tent, your weights, your garment bags on top, every square inch of the vehicle is stuffed 
And it's really more weight than that van was ever designed to carry safely. How much inventory do you, do you take? Like how many different pieces do you take as a, somebody that's bringing clothes? Do you uh, have like a usual amount that you have hanging up or what? Do you change I, well, it as the fair goes along? Like, yeah, not I do everything. It. I, definitely. It's like any other retail display. What you put out front is what people see. So sometimes it helps to rotate your display. I typically take 100 pieces. It's definitely two garment bags stuffed uh, with inventory of handwoven garments. Oh, going back to the tent, um, often these art fairs are, you know, in, on grass, in parks, in streets. They're not always level. So you need to carry spare parts to help get your display level. Um, you need shims, you need, you just need spare parts so that you can rearrange your display if you have uneven terrain. terrain. I have done one art fair where my booth space was on a hillside. So I had the front of my booth legs fully extended. And since these legs telescope, the rear of them were just fully compressed. So I had this steep incline for my booth. It was nuts. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I was standing on a slope like a mountain goat the entire weekend. It was not desirable. But yet you have to be ready to do something with your display so it will fit. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Going back to art fairs. Not only do you need to have spare parts, you need to bring a couple things for yourself if you're going to do these art fairs. You need to have very comfortable shoes because you're going to be standing the entire weekend. You might want to bring uh, two pairs of shoes. You can change them out to give your feet a break. Extra pair of dry socks, that's always handy. In your kit, you need to have a rain jacket for those sudden downpours when you're stuck in the booth but need to you know, dash to the van or something. Um, you need to have a chair to sit in. Most art fair artists will have um, a chair that is higher so that when you are resting on that chair, you are still eye level with your customer. So you are, you are there to make contact with them visually, but you still need to rest. Sometimes you need to have a floor mat or rug covering the concrete. Um, some of the art fairs are in parking garages and there are oil stains from vehicles parking. So uh, I usually put down some sort of inexpensive paper first to absorb the oil and then put a rug over it. Um, Home Depot, again, has a $50 gray carpet that rolls up. It's indoor, outdoors. I've used bamboo rugs over the different years. I think now I have um, another fatigue mat-like rug that has some cushion to it. Uh, and I really do that for me <laughs> because standing on a hard surface for an entire weekend can be very um, hard on you. Hard, hard on your legs. Uh, let's see, floor mats, extra dry shots, shoes for the entire weekend. Yes. Okay. So the other part of having a booth is you're going to need straps. You're going to need ratcheting straps. And these are to uh, support, to hang the weights from your tent. Uh, there are other art for artists who say you need to make an X of straps across the outside walls of the tent so when the high wind comes, it helps the tent from not twisting because when the top twists, the bottom is weighted, but the top is twisting, your art is falling off the walls and you need to secure it. One way you can do that is with these long ratcheting straps that make an X across the frame in the back and on the side walls. I have a a light dome tent and in the top corner joints, they have a, a, a bracket with three holes in it. One hole for hanging the weights, weighted straps. And I put a U-bolt in there. Mm -hmm. And I, that is easier for me to get my straps into. 
So you can modify some parts of your tent to make it a more secure structure. Um, it's, getting, it's getting a little abstract for me because I don't have a tent yet. You're like, you know, I think now, <laughs> now that we've talked about it, I want to go to an event just to have a look at what people are hanging up. But I'm like, I want a nice outdoor event. <laughs> <laughs> where, where there's not a lot of people so that I'm not getting sick. <laughs> well, I uh, many years ago, my um, older brother was in Peoria and I went to the Peoria Art Fair. It was a way to connect with family. That was great fun. And he was interested in doing art fairs because he was a wood turner. And his initial response of looking at all the tents, well, they're all white. And that's all he saw until it was time for him to buy his own tent. And he started going back and said, oh, my goodness, they're all different. Everybody has a different, unique solution that they have done for their display. And he started to discriminate between the various tents, the pros and the cons. My very first art tent was all steel um, conduit pipes. It was heavy. I now do the light dome because it's lighter, but it's engineered with a slightly rounded top so that the wind goes over it. It's less likely to uh, take the full force of the wind. All right, so what else do you need in your tent? You need a desk or a shelf so that you can process credit cards where your customers can write you checks, where you can put your business card or uh, have people sign up for an email list. Collecting contact information is the other aspect of what you need in your booth is a dedicated desk. You can do with the grid wall, you can buy a shelf um, and set up a temporary desk. Um, there are a lot of different systems for coming up with a desk. The other most important piece of equipment you need to be an art fair artist is a hand truck, a convertible hand truck. It's either a horizontal or like you might see for the appliances, it, it's more vertical. I have a handle that converts either both directions, but that hand truck is gonna help you unload from your vehicle and move the heavy equipment to your booth spot. Wheels are good anything on wheels. I have, um, I go to Goodwill and I get suitcases with wheels and I put things in them because they have wheels. <laughs> and it's easier for me to uh, pull an old suitcase that has all the small pieces in it than it is for me to carry it and walk with it. Um, question? I think I've used a golf bag for some things too. Yes. Um, with the with the hand truck, did you find a lighter version than what they use for like appliances? Like, did you find something that's a little more user friendly than that? Um, you don't really want a lighter version. You oh, really? Up. Okay, yeah. okay. Because yeah. I have one, but it's very heavy. Okay, cool. So um, I used the grid wall. I used grid wall for many years. They are two feet wide and seven feet tall. They weigh twenty pounds each, and. And in my early days, I had 10 of them in my booth. That's 200 pounds. And if you're going to put them on a hand truck, you need a hand truck with that capacity. So um, grid walls in their day were wonderful, and I use them all the time. But they're, in my effort to be a better artist and get into the better shows, I submitted my images for a jury review by an independent person whose business was to help us have better images and better booth displays. To get into most of the, the shows that I do, uh, I compete against my peers. And you really need to look at those shows, look at those artists that you esteem and learn from them. Not copy from them, but learn from them. How do they do it? When you're doing these shows, you are competing against them. So you need to be able to present your work to say, my work is unique and different from others, and this is why. And you do that with your jury images. Typically, an, a show that uh, 
requires jury images, you have four product images and one booth image. You also have an artist statement. Some shows want the short version, some want the medium version, someone want the unlimited full statement. And you need to sit down and write your artist statement. I encourage you not to talk about the flowers you see outside your kitchen window as inspiration. That's been overused over the years. <laughs> so uh, having to sit down and write the nuts and bolts of your artist statement is really the hardest thing to do because it forces you to really say, how is my work different from all these other really wonderful weavers that are out there in the world? I'm a weaver. They're a weaver. We use similar tools, similar materials. How do my customers know that my work is not their work. So it takes time to develop your statement about your mission, your goal, your inspiration, and why it's important. And you, you said that you at one point had um, all of your jury images reviewed by somebody and your artist statement reviewed by somebody that helps with that? Yeah, who, yeah. Who, what, in, in, in the day, a person by the name of Bruce Baker would give um, conferences, workshops, and he, for 50 bucks, he would review your images and be brutally honest about whether or not this was um, going to cut it. And it was hard to get that advice, but I did. Is there it. anybody nowadays that you know does it? This Bruce guy, I'm, I imagine, is retired. <laughs> <laughs> you said back in the day. So I'm thinking. Yes. Yes. So, again, this is for applying to juried art shows. Um, on Facebook, there is a free Facebook group called, I mean, I wrote it down here, make sure I get it right. It's Larry Berman and Jury Image Evaluation is the Facebook group. Jury, G U R Y. J U R Y. J U R Y Image. Evaluation is the art fair group, excuse me, the Facebook group. It's free. People submit their images and um, other artists as well as Larry jump in. Larry Berman is a friend of mine. I have known him for many years because of um, art fairs and uh, I send him my images and he cleans them up and prepares them for applications for ZAP application and juried art services. And he drops them into those two websites for me where I have a portfolio sitting there waiting for me to apply to shows. Um, Jerry, um, Larry is just amazing. He's also a former art fair artist, but his specialty is to take our images and enhance them, clean up the background, take out the shadows, the reflective surfaces, and help you present the very best that you can. Um, I'm also going to say if any of you want my help with review with wearable art, um, I'm giving this free today because I'm happy to share. But if you want Thank help, you. personal help with writing your art artist statement or talking about jury images to get your best images, um, I will offer my services, but it won't be for free. <laughs> okay. It, it, you know, I, I want to help. Uh -huh. But it's not, I can't give away everything. Yeah, I, I understand. Okay. I put right. um, in the chat, I put uh, what I found when I searched jury images, uh, and I'm not sure if it's the right one. I, I was wondering if you could just have a look at the Facebook one and see if it's the, uh, um, if it's the, if it's your friend's, <laughs> jury, <laughs> if it's Larry Berman's. Evaluation, that looks right. It is? Okay, good. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, uh, join group. Boom! I'm gonna join right now. <laughs> I read. Um, I was doing a little bit of research before the show, and then realized we were gonna go be on concrete, so it wasn't gonna help. But um, I read in one thing about which tent to or buy or awning to buy, and you know, honestly, at the time I had little context. You know, like what you're talking about. Like you're like, okay, so I, this they're is all white, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, kind of. You know, and then I was hearing what they're saying, but one of the places was saying that you can. Um, one of the ways to anchor your awning or whatever is with those twist dog ties, like that kind of a oh, stake. Yeah, actually, um, there's something better. Okay. Now, you can only use those um, 
stakes when you're in a park. Uh, the city people don't want you doing that on their asphalt streets. Uh, so you have to be prepared to tie in whether you're on asphalt, brick, I'm laughing. Or park, right? <laughs> so there is an artist um, who does who looked at this dog stake issue, and they said we can do this better. So there is something called the orange screw, which is a uh, stake system that I highly recommend. And a young couple out of Bend, Oregon, came to the Bend Art Fair. And was showing this them, and I think all of us purchased them. So they have a, um, they found a better angle for the screw to make it better for staying in the ground. And it's this, this nice little compact, really tough plastic. And it has a device so that you can screw it in, take it out, and store it all in two pieces. Uh, so I have some orange screws. Uh, I highly recommend them over the dog stakes. I used to have goats. We used to use those goat stakes. <laughs> uh, it's called mooring stews, like mooring like your boat? Mooring? No, no. Um, it, they are orange, the color orange, the orange oh, okay. grew. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's information you can rich. come back and ask me about that, and I'll dig one out to show as an example. I just had forgotten about that today. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you want to talk about jury images, um, we can do that. But see, what else? let me look at this. Um, hmm. The other thing about doing these art fairs is you need to advertise that you're doing them. It's helpful if you have a website and a list of customers who are interested in following you. The art fairs help promote you. So having a website is a great digital business card. In addition to having the website, you do need to actively promote yourself through social media. It's free, and it's an important way to get your presence out there on a as best you can. We all come to that with different levels. And when you're promoting, do you promote the art fair, or do you promote the fact that you're going to be at it? Do you, do you say, hey, this art fair is happening, it's awesome, or are you like, yeah, hey, you, need you to can come and see me if you go to this art fair? You, you need to um, cross-advertise, if you will. You advertise, connect to the art fair, as well as connect to your audience. Oh, you do that okay. with hashtags. Oh, okay. Right. And I think the other way is the little at sign um, in Instagram helps that your posts show up in their area. So when you do this, you, you use hashtags on Facebook. I've never been good at that, so I'm just trying to understand. Uh, hash, yeah, um, I was at the American Craft Council show in San Francisco, and they had some Amazon Marketplace people trolling the show, and they, their interns sat down with me and, and told me about how invaluable hashtags were. Hashtags are searchable words. I know, but you use them in Facebook, or do you, do you just use them in blog posts? Or I, I understand what they are. I just never understand how to really use them. Use them as often as you can. Try and tag your images as well with the subject matter of what it is. As people search in places like Pinterest, think of what you're trying to look for in Pinterest. And then you start to realize that those search words is, it, is helping you find information on Pinterest. You could search craft fair booths on Pinterest. And it's because people have put those hashtags in their images that they are found. When you put a hashtag in an image, do you actually put the hashtag with the image name, like hashtag Weaver or whatever, or do you just put Weaver and that's the tag? Do you know what alt text is? No. Okay. Alt text is, um, is an issue that is coming up more and more often because it helps those people who have disabilities use the technical world. So you describe your image with words. And now it's becoming more of a requirement because of uh, people with disabilities, they wanna have access to. So if you have an image, you put an alternate text alt text, which describes what the image is about. And you might just say, you know, coat with leather buttons. 
So I, I, I'm just not understanding people. where I where I put these tags. So I, I think in naming an image, is that where I put the tag? And do I need the hashtag symbol with it? Or where does this alt text show up? I'm uh, websites. Mainly, it's, if you're building a website, that's the first place you would use it. Hashtags and at signs are things you're going to be using on Facebook and Instagram. Instagram I, is known sorry. for the hashtags. Go ahead. Yes, please. Sorry. Um, I know like when I'm posting on like, let's say our group page, it'll have a place for like a title for the image and then it'll have a description. So would I put the hashtags in the description and the alt text there, but in the name of the, just to keep the title kind of clean to whatever it is? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think that'd be a good way to do it. Okay, thanks. I'm not an expert on all the so social media <laughs> stuff, but I've learned this much, and I learned a lot from the Amazon. Uh, well, I feel like an expert. Amazon. That's drinking from a fire hose, which is this whole like fair <laughs> thing that we're doing right now. But you know, a non-expert <laughs> on another, social media is going to be able to right. talk at my level. <laughs> oh, um, I think your name and brand out there more. What she's talking about hashtags as well. Like I felt so intimidated with them when I started doing social media. But I realized like when I would go start looking for things, there's like hundreds of thousands of things. Like, so if you hashtag sustainable fashion, sustainable designer, like upcycle, you can click that or look and put that into Facebook. And then you have all kinds of posts, all different kinds of groups, different people show up. Yeah. And so that's something, or even like you're talking about art fair, like Seattle art fair, 21, like stuff like that. So I think she's right on with that's kind of where things are at. And I know I need to do more hashtags with some of my art, like with the Santa Fe Art Institute or Santa Fe um, art market going on. There's super amazing artists and artwork going on down there. And so it's just so crazy that you're having this conversation today because I was just thinking like, man, one day I want to go down there and show my work. And you see everybody's different boosts that they're posting. And I didn't realize so much stuff went into it. And like we do different events for some of our nonprofit organizations and slowly we're realizing like the cheap, the cheaper quality tents. And even we've had numerous tents blow over. Oh yeah. Invested in the sandbags and now it's heat. So we got, all these little, um, those little spray misters, we have some of those. So it's kind of like a trial and error, but I didn't even yep. realize like, and then also when you're talking about, you had to up and run, like you want to make sure that your stuff is safe, not going to get blown away not getting soaked. Cause there's so much that goes into your inventory and I'm just super like blown away right now. Like, and then when you're talking about the artist statement and bio and all that I'm taking a visit native arts business class right now and then that's what they're talking about the importance of your bio your statement your artist statement so that has your bio your mission your values your goals what makes you stand out from everybody else and mm -hmm. I'm just like totally taking it all in as well and then I see a lot of I'm friends with a lot of artists on Facebook most of my feed is just like um, fine arts, like sewist, seamstresses, and all different types of art, but that's what they're talking about, getting their pieces ready for jury. Like, I don't know the whole terminology, but I was just curious about that as well. So thank you for all your input. And Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy uh, to talk about it. You know, I, I've, I've been soaking it up for over 30 years, so I have a lot of stories to share. And I think that's the point of growing older. As an older woman, I want to be able to sit around the fire with stories to tell. And I have a few. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd yeah, love to, if we, if, Karen, if we could, I'd love to debrief a little bit with Elena on what we did last weekend and maybe have, have your input. And uh, as we talk about that, like what worked and what didn't. And yeah, well, I, I had some thoughts about it right away. If I could just give you my sure, point. Of for view. It. <laughs> Here's the hard part. Because I've tried to share a booth in my early days as well. It was seemed like a great way to keep the cost down and, and willing to do it with another artist friend. The hard part is a 10 by 10 space is not very large to share. And if one of the, if your friend's work has a customer, 
there's no room for your customer to come in. So I don't think sharing a booth is a good idea unless you're doing it for some sort of charitable organization and you, you're all doing it for the, the bigger cause. It's awkward to represent your work in front of your friend who's sharing the booth with you. It's not, you're not, you don't, it's hard to dominate the space because it's so small and you need to, you need to connect with your customers and talk about your work. My friend was doing some sort of uh, baby clothing and I'm doing handwoven garments. So we weren't really a good fit to begin with. We had a different customer base. I'm just going to tell you, I really hear that because Elena was setting our booth up to have a nice child station so that the moms could shop while they're there. And I'm totally designing with teens and young adults in mind. And the last thing they want to look like is a mom. So it was like, <laughs> we are advertising in ways that are going to repel two different groups of people, you know, yeah. I'm repelling the moms and she's <laughs> repelling the, the kids. And so it was awkward in that way. Yes. Yeah, it is. So I think it's great to be supportive of each other. If you want to request a booth side by side, so you can help each other but it's really better to have your own space. Well, but then there is the question that you brought up, which is great. Um, where we come together is with our, our, what's charitable about our group of indie designers is that we all care about the environment. And on that level, we can brand together, you know, and it's still, I mean, I, I think it's an ongoing conversation for all of us as we collaborate is how do we, navigate our different brands inside what we our shared values and how do yeah. we emphasize our shared values so that there is room for our brands it's it's confusing but that thank you for your yeah. comment <laughs> and validating our challenge <laughs> uh, okay so here's one other very important business uh, component that you need to know about art fairs now require us to have liability insurance so if someone is in your booth and they get injured in any way, they can sue you. So you need to have liability insurance. Now, some folks will go to uh, insurance companies like State Farm, and you need to have something that's above and beyond your homeowner's insurance. It's coverage for liability for your business. Yeah, I have um, production insurance, which is pretty much the most expensive you can get until you go to um, the stunt people. So I think, okay. I think, but, but I think I need to have a conversation with our insurance person because I haven't done any retailing. So to make sure that the retail space is covered, that's a great point. So I use something called ACT insurance is called actors, crafters, and tradespeople. It is a policy that you can get coverage for one show that's very affordable or for an entire year. It, cover, it meets the liability requirements for the major shows that I do. And that liability requirement is, is pretty high. It's like, uh, just a lot of money if someone can sue you for. So I need to have that coverage. I have to show the proof of insurance to these festivals before I participate. Um, I got the full year of coverage. So when I'm on the road and if something should happen, I have coverage. The downfall is that it only covers the cost of materials of my goods, the things I've made. But um, I should share with you, I have had people break into my booth overnight and vandalize and steal my artwork at Park City, Utah. Um, I have also had my booth set up in my backyard last September, and we had a freak and sudden windstorm that turned my veteran art fair booth into a pretzel overnight. It totally destroyed my booth. Uh, the winds were so high. Uh, and I, I was stunned because I had it weighted, I had it staked, I had it strapped, but yet that wind was devastating. ACT insurance covered the replacement, total replacement value for a new tent. So if it's a, a, quish, a question of 
tent being destroyed by weather, they covered the full cost. But they didn't it, um, cover, they only covered materials when you were vandalized. I had to show proof of, I had to show receipts for um, purchase of materials that went into the things that were vandalized and stolen. I was able to do that and they were very kind to me. You know, I, I was able to recover the cost that I needed. Um, never recovered the goods, but I was okay with the coverage. There is another level of insurance called marine insurance which covers total replacement value. And it will be more expensive. But yeah, I have I have marine because I know for rentals of expensive production equipment. So I know I have that. You probably have that level of insurance. If, yeah. if you, you just need to make sure that it'll, it covers you going to art fairs. Yeah, yeah. So it's a conversation I have before. I go to another art fair or <laughs> one, one or two air. I think there's one or two art fairs before I commit to the art fair path. You know, I need to, I need to see um, whether it's right for me or not before I yeah. invest in it. Cause there's, there are other business models like the runway and client model. And there's also the retail store model. Like, so there are a few different business models and, and it can be a yes. And, but I feel like, uh, the craft market, it's a huge commitment, you know, it's a commitment of time and investment, but selling directly yourself is, I think, more profitable, like, because you're doing all the work, right? It's m so much more profitable. Um, and you have a lot of control over it. If it's a little flexible thing that can go from one place to another, you could also uh, uh, treat people, it as a pop up shop in a retail business. Yes, you know? right. People like to have a relationship with the artist, you know, they really like to meet us. Uh, they become an extension of uh, of our family, if you will. They, so yes, I think it's important. I have questions about your runway events. That you know, it's it's an area that I've been kind of looking over the fence, saying, should I be thinking about this? So well, you I should think about the Seattle Recycled Arts one because you know <laughs> I'm coordinating that. So you got, you got an insider here on your side. Um, if you ever use material fi or recycled fibers or anything like that, that would be really exciting to see a piece or two that had that had been woven from some repurposed materials or cords or fabrics. So just to put your creative thought into it, we have about, um, I think, four weeks, five weeks. I don't know. It's mid-October is when submissions will close. They haven't even opened up yet. So uh, my goal is to take my scraps that are left over from cutting the initial garments and finding a way to repurpose them. That oh. one I, I, I do on a regular basis. That's I great. Then, then you ask should myself with a way to use those pieces because they're too valuable to throw away. Yeah. You should be in our, you should be in our um, recycled art show then. <laughs> yeah. And, and you two ladies also should be making pieces for that. Or at least there. make it more sustainable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So insurance, that's a big thing to cover. It's also a very important thing to have. Uh, like I said, I've had my work stolen. Um, and that really talks about what do you do if you're going to leave your art in the booth overnight. And you do feel these zippers lock then? I assume you zip down and it has a way to lock it like a suitcase would. A knife goes through anything. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. So it, it, this is a security is another issue. And it's a big one. It's a big one. Can you take a bunch of your highest value inventory out? Like, I mean, and yeah, in that's your what you wind up doing is that you have to, again, this has to do with picking the right venue, an art fair that really looks out for you and having a booth where you can have access with your hand truck or rolling rack to remove inventory overnight. It's hard work. I've done it. And it's like, it's real easy when you're all setting up and they let the vehicles come close to the booth. But once the art fair is set up, you can't bring your vehicle in. You've got to be able to wheel your inventory out. And it's a lot of work. It's hard. Uh -huh. uh, I have done other things. I have um, put an alarm in my booth. So if someone stepped on the rug, the alarm would go off. But I also have to let the security people who are there overnight that that, that is there so they can turn it off. That doesn't always work. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, at the end of night, you need to cover your work totally. 
just in case there's um, dew or dust or rain, you want to cover your wearable art. So I, I put the garment bags all back on. Um, I, then I try and put something across the entrance to the booth. So if someone does try and get into the booth, they have to stumble over my ladder and my chair. You know, it's not, it's, it'll make noise if they get in. Uh, you do what you can. But the truth is anyone can get in a tent if they have a, a knife. They can just slash the side, slide, excuse me, sidewalls and have access. So number one, you never keep valuables in the tent. You don't leave money in the tent. You don't leave electronics in the tent overnight. The other thing is as women artists who are walking back to their hotels or their uh, cars after the end of a show, make it a habit to walk with a fellow artist. Never walk by yourself. You are probably carrying money um, in your purse or bags. So just make it a habit to walk out together for your own safety. Oh, I travel across the country. Sometimes I'm driving 20,000 miles a year as I go to the Midwest or the East Coast and back. I have learned to travel by myself. And one of the things that I do is I like to stop at places like Starbucks because they have a clean restroom. It's uh, the right demographic for a comfort for stopping. Also, they have a coffee I like to drink. But you need to make a practice of being safe. So you pick safe places to stop. The other handy tip, if you are going to be a road warrior, is that if you are driving across country, it's really helpful to stop every 200 miles and get out of the van. Walk around. You need to do it for your circulation. <laughs> you can't drive 10 hours in a day and not get out of the car and expect to be able to stand up straight again. So I have the practice of stopping every 200 miles, whether I need to or not, just for my body. Move around, get some air, stay alert, and make sure that my blood is still circulating. <laughs> Um, going to art fairs, the first thing I do, I service my van. I take it in. I make sure that it is ready to go, that there's air in the tires, there's oil in the engine. I have a full tank of gas. I have windshield wiper fluid. Anything that needs to be done for the vehicle, I'm going to take it in for servicing first. I've had too many episodes of being in the middle of nowhere needing service for a vehicle and they don't have parts that I need. So you, you, you need to be very well acquainted with your vehicle for travel. Um, it's helpful if you have some kind of hotel rewards as you are staying in various hotels across, across the country. Sometimes uh, I use bookings.com and you get some discounts if you're a frequent visitor with the hotels. But more importantly, I think it's to have those reward systems for Marriott or Best Western or whatever chain that you're doing because you get the better rate. Um, how, it is very, how much better, like 20% better or like, is it be more than that or? Well, the further in advance that you can book a hotel, the more likely you're going to get the better rate. Uh, I don't hesitate to ask for the senior discount. I qualify at this point. Um, yeah, all those dollars make a difference. Um, let's see. It's also important to have in your booth and in your vehicle emergency kits. This is for not just Band-Aids, but for any kind of small emergency kit. Uh, you know, the Tylenol, the gauze, the alcohol for sterilizing. It, it's handy to have those available. It's also important in your car to have the emergency kit if you're broken down on the roadside. Reflectors or flares, jumper cables. I can still remember being in Los Angeles at an art fair and my friends were making fun of me because I was really happy I had a pair of jumper cables in my van. They were making fun of me for being overprepared. 
And the next day, that same person came and said, ask if she could borrow them because her car wouldn't start. So the moral of the story is, yes, you do need to be prepared and it's worth it. It's not <laughs> being overprepared. It's just reality is that our cars aren't all new and jumper cables are absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Oh, my last little tip for hotel staying. Sometimes art fairs are just really exhausting and you don't have the energy to go out for dinner later on. Um, often I would carry instant oatmeal or miso soup in my kit so that if I was too tired, I could still have something hot in the room. But I've also discovered that Uber Eats or uh, what do they call it? Grubhub. Uh, or services like that where they deliver to the room, it's absolutely a lifesaver. You can just have your feet up and be trying to get warm after a cold, wet weekend, and you can have soup delivered to the room, and it's just heaven. So those are handy on-the-road kind of tips. All right, I'm sure there's other things I could help you with, but... I think I've covered a lot. <laughs> okay. Then I'm going to circle back uh, to my question for Elena. So like, what do you think worked really well from what we did? And um, what would you want to do different on the next one? Um, well, for me, I just wanted to see what kind of interest there was in the types of things we were doing. Like if there were people that were interested in recycled items or like in sustaining things, or if we were like totally like our neighborhood was not a good hub of that, you know, so I did get that. I also, um, for me, my other goal was kind of to get to know you guys better by being there because then I kind of know my team, you know, in a more hands-on way. I definitely got that. Um, I think I agree with the taller chair. I was totally thinking I would love to have like a, a stool type of chair with a back and maybe even like a little table that's higher so that you can sit there if you're working on something, because I, you know, I think there's some interest in that if you're working on something you can still engage, but, um, and also somewhere where you can, you know, have something at that level, like if you were exchanging money or whatever it was, I, I really like that idea. Plus it feels a little bit cafe-ish. So that was kind of in my head. Um, I, I mean, originally when I talked to him, I thought, oh, we'll do two spaces. And then I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to be hot. There is no way. So I do agree that having a couple spaces, even with just that many people, even if we were sharing it, it was just too small. You know what I mean? Like I didn't yeah, really and bring I, anything. I had a little so, feeling like of uh, 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 I, uh, I kept forgetting to promote Denise, you know, like I'm talking to people mm. about my stuff and definitely, um, uh, I thought it was good having a sign, uh -huh. you know, I, I might want to yes. upgrade our sign to something that's, you know, a little more permanent, but you think it might be better to divide out and have individual designer booths and just, we could help each other set up. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way that I could have set up here that no. I don't see either of us being able to set the booth up alone. No, and that was totally fun. Like, there's a camaraderie in that that I yeah. loved. And I, even if it was, I don't know if they'd let you do two booths with the overarching thing and then the different designers just because of space. Um, but one thing I would say when I had to leave and come back, one thing that I think worked really well was having your your piece on display on the corner. It yeah, drew I think in so many people. Yeah, there's just the showstopper piece out there on the corner. And that thing, and not only that, when I drove by, I noticed that. I noticed that. I noticed the sign right away. And I was like blocks away on the street. So that was really cool. And the location in that was Yeah, we great. did get a good location. But that's because we were there early and it was, you know, first come, first serve at this particular thing. But I wouldn't have <laughs> even known it was good. Honestly, my brain wasn't, you know, like, <laughs> uh -huh. I was just like, okay, a spot. You know, so yeah, I well, recognize it. me too. I didn't have any sense of that. So I thought that worked, uh, setting up together, I thought worked really well. Mm -hmm. I, I think sure. we could have separate booths if it's a free thing like this was, that it's no problem. Right. We're just, oh, except you guys don't have the legal, we as a group are learning on my business license and stuff. So so yeah. that would have to be corrected if we had to, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, and I, I could go Spellcaster Aggie V, my individual brand instead mm -hmm. of the group brand. But I, I, I feel like until I know I want to do these things, I would stick yeah. with the group brand. I think I would take one display rack instead of two, just to like unburden us from having to put two of them in. Mm -hmm. I actually feel like less is more on display. Like it, it felt oh, crowded and yeah. cluttered in our booth. And I would like to 
take fewer things and, and then re or rotate out the display. Like Karen was saying that she brings more inventory than she puts on display so that when people are looking at a display, you know, there's only four, four or five things to look at. It's not dozens. And then if they walk by two hours later, have a different four or five up, you know? So I think I like that idea. I don't think a changing room was, um, needed at all like I wouldn't set it up I might bring it and if somebody really was going to try on pants or something we could pop it up in a for a temporary thing but I don't think it was needed there's actually um some very very true and hard fast rules about the booth space in a juried art fair I don't think necessarily for the level that you were participating in but all other shows we have a 10 by 10 spot that is ours and usually two feet behind it that is ours. Sometimes that back space is shared with the booth behind us, a different row. So there might be four feet, but you only get two feet to put your extra stuff that are outside the booth. It is absolutely um, not okay to have your chair outside of the booth. It blocks the flow of traffic. And other artists will get mad at you because your booth is deflecting. It's just like the water in a river. The water goes around the boulders. If you've got your chair in front of your booth, people will go around you and they miss the next booth. So, um, the art so we might be able to put our display like under the edge of an awning if we're in a different kind of environment. So it could be yeah, at the front of our booth, but not you out. You have front. to work within your 10 by 10 space. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that gets complicated. So for me, I try to design a, uh, a storage space, a closet, if you will, in the back of my booth where I can put a rolling rack that has the back inventory. I have access to it. I reach through and get it, but it's, it's my closet. And I can put my tent bags there for tear down, but they're not visible in the front of the booth. I can have my battery, which I use to operate my credit card sales. If there's no electricity at the vent, you need to have a place to put that where it's out of sight. So I do this in my, the, my booth space is actually not 10 by 10. It's 10 by eight because two feet of it is my storage. Your closet area. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Another thing that worked out well, Eleanor, was I did get my square space thing for my phone um, and the fact that I could enter credit cards, both of my purchases were by credit card. Um, so I think that was good. Uh, where it didn't work was the slider really didn't recognize the credit cards and I had to manually put them in. So I think I would invest in a much better physical the unit upgraded. for that. Wow. Uh, the slider ones, the chip ones are the ones that you want to have. The, okay. the ones that are not chipped or just um, slid without the chip you, you get in trouble with these now. Credit cards have changed. You need to only accept chip cards and you need a device that will accept them. So you can't do the old dip kind. You, you've got to, well, no. Why, I guess why is it, what's yeah. the problem with the uh, um, It's about security. Oh, okay. you don't, you, they will not guarantee that sale. Oh. You might lose money from the credit card company because you don't have the chip information. Interesting. So you have to get the one that allows you to record the chip. What about the tap thing or like the, the Apple tap, Pay? The tap would give you, yes, okay. the tap gives you the chip information. Okay. And I think on, when I looked on Squarespace, I think it was a difference of like how much they take out of your sales or you can pay for it up front or. I can't yeah, my husband that said that Venmo charges much more you know, a mm -hmm. higher percent. So okay. PayPal um, is a reasonable and professional rate and the, you know, what you're paying on a reader is less than that. So, yeah. Okay. And the other thing is if you're the one that has the square account, legally, you're not supposed to be processing another business transaction through your business account. Yeah, we that didn't. I don't think that issue actually came no. up. So, <laughs> she didn't actually sell anything, did she? Except the hat to no. me that I gave her fifty dollars for. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> I was thinking, um, I, 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 one of the things that's been on my mind is like, you know, how you did have the two racks that if one rack had like a logo for one of the designers and another oh, one had a logo for another that's designer. That's a great idea. Different logo designers. Kind of like when you go in a store and you go, oh, this is by that person or this is by that person. If it was a, a group thing that type of a display concept I think might work. Yeah. And I really liked your display. This is um, off topic. I'd love for the video from our last challenge. If you, if you'd get me a photo of um, maybe put your mask on your daughter so that we can uh -huh. see how it hangs down. Oh you know? yeah. Right. I need to do better pictures of that. Yeah. yeah give sure. me some good pictures of that. Cause I thought okay. that was really cool. And, and I didn't feel like we had any way to support your work in terms of displaying it. Oh yeah. And I, I didn't find it until. Halfway through the thing. So that's part of it. <laughs> I was like, where did I put that? <laughs> um, that was <laughs> just, just cycling back to where we started with all this is that you're all starting a small business. And I think that's wonderful. And I think it's, you know, an extension of, of making the work as we need to get it out into the world. Um, you also need to apply for a business name in your state, register your mm -hmm. business. This is going to be very handy as you set up a business account, apply, for, you know, have credit references so that you can have a merchant account. You need to have a registered business name. In the state of Oregon, I think I pay 50 bucks a year for the privilege of having a registered business name. And that I, I think in Washington, it's only a one-time fee. So it's, and it's about that, like it's a yeah. little fee, but then it's and a one-timer. That means and I don't know on the reservation, like you're in a different legal position, Mercedes, because technically you're in a different country, right? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know if she's... Yeah, the, the rules are a little... It's really tricky trying to navigate between state and reservation because reservation is federal. Mm -hmm. Like there's a whole different... It's a whole different ballgame. It's confusing. I'm still trying to navigate it as well, like trying to register a business name and all of the But the, the brilliant thing about registering your business name is that it, it's like your website. It's your domain. Mm -hmm. And nobody else can have that name or share that name. Uh, and I, I, I've also had the experience of someone who – well, maybe wanted your name, the Oregon Weaver. Yeah. That's a great name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So why did why did I choose the Oregon Weaver? I'll explain it that too. Uh, I am married. I have my husband's name. It's not necessarily easy to pronounce or spell correctly, and he has a brother who has a higher profile in the world than uh, we do. So I decided that I needed a name in three words or less that said where I lived and what I did. And that's why I chose the Oregon Weaver. Nice. nice. That's, that also allowed me to wear another hat in my real life. I am both a wife and a mother and a weaver. So, you know, I have to- It's, have a, it's a different square. identity, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, anything else from our booth, Elena? Um, well, I would like to sketch, I mean, cause I think we were kind of like the way we just played, we just kind of went for it and then we were running out of time. I would definitely like to sketch out the space on like a, um, grid and kind of uh -huh. have some different options. And then like, if we were going, let's say, and like, no, like, okay, this is what we're doing and go for it because now we have a little bit of an idea, you know, this is how we want it to look because I think there was a lot of decision-making that we had to make, which was totally expected you yeah know, and then I we think kind of sat down and were like thank god we're here and we never yes yeah. we didn't no i know i'm like sitting diagonally in the center of it like, <laughs> like i'm dying <laughs> so, so maybe i'll be a little more intentional next time and i think that would be fun um question though you said about the 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 like the um closet space you have you keep that within your booth unless they give you two two feet behind it do you have a curtain? Do you have a divider wall? What do you do visually? Or is it just I use, that you have the other? I, I, I use the banjo drapes. I, I'll come up okay. with a system. You know, in the next two weeks, I hope to do um, some broadcasting from my backyard. And I, um, hopefully that I will be able to do a virtual experience. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm going to put a blog post out there. And I think, Stacey, you're on my email list for those posts. Uh -huh. 
right um, now because we'd love to see the inside of your booth in detail. Right. <laughs> you know, after 30 years of doing all these art fairs, I finally come up with the perfect booth. So uh. <laughs> it really took this long. Nice. Right on. Right on. Uh, we want to see and it. It's, it's just about, you know, constantly searching for a way to have a clean gallery experience that's not overstocked not too crowded. The hard part for wearable artists is that not only do we have to show our samples of what we can do, we have to have a variety of sizes or color choices for our customers. And um, that therefore, right away, our booth has got too many things in it to look at. Right. Um, but that's what they want. They want choice. Uh -huh. The other thing I can talk about with the booth space is there is a, a philosophy called feng shui, the feng shui of a booth mm -hmm. space. Uh -huh. You need to have on the right side something that is approachable, both visually and in price point. The lower price items on the right. Then you move around, you have something on the side wall that keeps people moving into the booth. The center back of the booth, you need to have a statement piece so people will walk totally into the booth. Mm -hmm. And then as you exit to the left, you have some of your higher priced items. And then finally, you have a sales station where you can close the sale. So you start with the lower price point as possible purchase. Now, right why are away. people coming in from the, right to left. the yeah. left? Why yeah. is people are lemmings? That's just the way <laughs> that's just the way it works. So the flow is always coming that same direction? There, yeah. And when if you really study an art fair, you want to study how people move through it. Uh -huh. And it's pretty interesting. <laughs> okay. That's... They'll turn right before they'll turn left. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> that's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question back on the business stuff. So let's say you have like you're creating your stuff, but there's like a couple different focuses you have and you want a name for each. Do you register that as well? Like, let's say, um, like, you know, you have, like when I'm doing this type of clothing, I, I put, you know, this under name on it, you know, like a, a subheading of that, you know. You mean your line? or like Yeah, I'm yeah, confused. with your own business line when you're doing that. Like, let's say you have titles for different sections of your stuff would you also register those so they're recognizable to you oh you mean on a business level yeah no just do a dba i mean once you're registered with like maybe you're going to just register your business name as elena corinne yeah mm -hmm. i don't know haas or yeah, whatever right. and then you you can have a dba okay. uh, doing business as do you, you register know? that yeah, you don't have to. I mean, you're going to want to tell your bank, right? Because people are going to be right. writing checks to you under these other names. But okay. you don't need a different name for every line. Like okay. that's, I mean, under Spellcaster IVD, I don't need a different name for my earth line or my fire line or my pop-up shop. You know, like they're mm -hmm. different categories for me, but I don't need different business names for them. Okay. I, I yeah, do yeah. feel like I need a different business name for my video production work and yeah, that's my fashion kinda, design work because it's right. just too confusing to people to be one thing, you know. Well, like I've done lanterns, and I find myself wanting to go to the late night, the name I used for film, like for one of my film productions, you know, or something that's kind of a yeah. Similar, well, I mean, you could you know? use the same name if you're mm -hmm. not doing film right now, but I feel like if it's a different business service or product, there. you probably film want cross. a different name. Okay. And, and also you want to check with your insurance people to make sure both are covered. But in terms of being a legal entity, you don't need to do that. Um, okay. And a, a doing business as is just whenever somebody needs your name, you give them your corporate name and you tell them you're doing business as and give them the name you want them to know you by. And that's the one that would show up in print and on, you know. Okay. One other question. As far as the craft fairs, do you ever have someone, like I used to have this dream and then I thought, well, you know, this actually sounds semi-feasible. Now you're talking about all the expenses, but do you ever have someone like, let's say, because I've seen these online occasionally that has like a double-decker bus or something that shows up and it's a boutique. Does that ever factor in or is that a totally outside thing? Like they show up at beach towns or they just show up in cities and let them know they're there. I you really know? was interested in doing some sort of pop-up using my Sprinter. Uh -huh. You know, a sprinter really is a vehicle. Admired, yeah, 
it's a cargo van, basically. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, it's not quite tall enough. I got the shorter version. If I got the full version, it would have been easier to stand in it for other people. Uh -huh. But I really thought I used to uh, follow on Pinterest those women designers who were couldn't afford retail space in downtown New York City. So they they figured out a way to do it with uh, a truck or a van. Like we um, have the trailer park mall here in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a marvelous idea. I think I that would be, is it, do you see that? I mean, do you think you have it's to, viable? You have, to get a, you have to get a permit from the city to be able mm -hmm. to do it. Okay. Yeah. A permit to park it. So anytime you're coming to a new city, you need to check in. It, okay. You're like, you're, you're like a food truck in that way. You have to have a permit from the city. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a pretty exciting way to have a retail business that's mobile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can develop a following. And here we go with hashtags. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like social media might be the way to go for that. Yeah, uh -huh. I like to kind of vagabond feel of it. It's like, <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah, maybe we could do something together. I'll yeah. figure out how to do it with the Sprinter. Yeah. The vagabond. Yeah. The, va the vagabond. Uh, Our the last place. Fashion Revolution, multi-designer. Right. Traveling, <laughs> pop-up shop. We go up and down the West Coast or oh something my one gosh, year. Yes. Next year. <laughs> yeah. There was and a, it's outdoor and, you know, social distance, only one person allowed at a time. So we can go. do it safely. We can put some chairs. People can hang out. Lounge. Out there. It's less yeah. likely to blow away since it's yes. made of metal and yes. <laughs> quickly put everything back in. If yeah, you we know the right. setup will be quick and easy. <laughs> I know. I kind of like that. Um, there was a there was actually three doors down from us in the place we lived in Arlington. They had a double decker bus that they had planned to read. So I was like, I just drool over that thing. The double I was decker like, oh bus. I'm gosh. thinking an old um, but airstream. Gas. <laughs> I know. I just yeah. wonder with gas and everything, like because oh, I love yeah. a lot of the retro looking, but then they're heavy and it costs a fortune and I, then it may not pan out so you may have to get something else mm, i just like longer. the idea it's, <laughs> nice idea. I, it's I, an idea i, I, I haven't too. had in my head at all anymore but i love this idea of like a few different designers and a traveling mm, show yeah well yeah, especially like for to, covid you know yeah you i could go, actually Karen could go to all about. the places that she's had art fairs and be like I'll be here, <laughs> not in well, the Well, I fair, thought but... about it. You could go into a town and you measure people, you get their orders, you go back and create it and you come back and you deliver it again, you know, or something if it was like, you know, some cycle thing too, or, you know, but you're actually there, you can get oh. like accurate too. Oh, so my so. big success from our, um, from last week is that we actually did get a, a, a bid on the jacket for $60 and uh, we sold it. So, okay. Yeah, that's my success. <laughs> oh, you don't know how hard it was to get people to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. Well, I think we should also talk about COVID-19 and the variants yeah. right now for a minute. Um, yeah. My, I understand why the art fairs are not just flat out canceling. And this is the way I believe that it works from conversations I had with some directors Art fairs have to get a permit from the city and the city was in the county and the county has to follow the rules from the governing state, the governor. So it has everything to do with insurance coverage, which these events have to have. If there is a, um, an emergency with weather, it's more likely that the, it'll come down from the county to the city is that you have to close the show. And with, when it works that way, they're, they're covered with the liability, the costs of closing the show safely so that there's not damage. With COVID-19, nobody can really agree about what they're supposed to do, what's in the best interest for all of us to do. And I'm not seeing that the shows are canceling. My heart of heart is that we need to stay away from art fairs right now. Uh -huh. We are too close to each other. They say that the virus is transmitted by water droplets. And even if you're fully vaccinated, you have the possibility of being contaminated with the virus and sharing it with those people, sometimes children, who are not vaccinated. Right. And my concern is that we need to get past this horrible time. Uh -huh. And if there's a way to stay home, that's the better way to do it. 
I have not been able to figure out a way to be in the booth and not have contact with people. I like to um, custom fit for my, my customers. They put the jacket on. I'm there with a tape measure and pens. We're talking about what needs to be taken in or let out. Even if we're wearing masks, we're too close. Mm -hmm. So um, in my heart of hearts, I, I, I know it was a, the hardest decision I've ever had to make, but I need to stay home. And I hope others follow and make the right adult decision is that we need to protect each other a little bit longer. Yeah. Find a way to uh, get past this horrible time. Well, I think it's the time to really invest in figuring out how to have your virtual image, how to maybe like Stacy was talking about doing a video on um, measuring properly, you know, that kind of thing that supports and builds your, you know, your presence and things that help when you come back around or whatever, I think that's the time still to invest in that, I guess, you know, the infrastructure, mm -hmm. finding ways to sell that way and to display. You know, the, uh, you talk about um, social media advertising with the art fairs is that, you know, we have to work together. The art fairs has an audience and they depend on the artist adding to their audience and it works the other way around. I depend upon the St. Louis Art Fair is promoting me as well. Um, and we, we do have to work together with the promotion to be successful. How much um, promotion do you do and what form does it take when you're coming up to a show? I mean, like how many posts can you put up about the same show before people are just like, good gosh, you're annoying me now. <laughs> Well, um, this past year, some, I don't know, 50 artists or so got their heads together and said, look, we're doing virtual shows. Let's just all of us get together under one label and promote through Instagram. All of us take turns and we will all share. So if there's 50 of us, we're all promoting to our venues. It just multiplies instantly the number of people who are seeing those posts. And we had to keep the post varied. So we did short videos. We had, you know, we got busy learning how to design. So what's the oh. Instagram feed that you're doing so we can all go and check it out? I believe it's under my name, Karen Gelbard. Oh, okay. So it's, uh, it's a, a group one, but it's all under your name? Well, we've stopped doing it oh, okay. we, because we all kind of splintered off into other things with this current year of covid uh -huh. um, some people are actually making the decision to go to shows uh -huh. uh, and i don't know why but they are yeah would yeah. we be able to see the posts that you guys did before under that like if we look up kind of is that karen possible? gilford i yeah. think it was art show artists okay. art show underscore artists okay was the group cool thank you and i don't see why you folks couldn't come up with something like that as well mm -hmm. where you, you got an Instagram uh, title. Yeah, we're just a small, we're a smaller group than 50 and uh, <laughs> everybody's, everybody's working on promoting their own thing too at the same time. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's just a, a challenge of doubling down, but we are, we're working on uh, fashion revolution is where we're putting our shared content and where we share what our different successes and where we talk about each other and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. also anything cool that we see out there, like, cause there's a lot that's interesting to us um, mm -hmm. that we share on there too. So we, and we have a Facebook group and an Instagram feed, but our Instagram feed, um, Ashley has been sort of the main person that's doing the post for that. So it's, uh, it's, you know, depends on what information I've provided to her, right? <laughs> so, and it could be a burden for one person to manage the whole Instagram feed for a group. Yeah. yeah kind of we, a so did you guys have a shared sign in or something like that? So that everybody there, could there were four administrators. Uh -huh. And so um, because we were all across the country, of course, these um, posts would come at all different times of the night. <laughs> So it was, uh, they decided that after a point, they just couldn't handle it anymore. And so we disbanded. But for a while, we did a really good job of getting our information out there. And there was a following. And of course, with Instagram, it's all about the following, the number of followers. Yeah, I think um, I, I like making visual content. You know, I love photos and I love pretty pictures. 
but I find it a very unfulfilling emotional thing. So um, I, you know, the relationship I, stuff is not there. Well, it te- so I mean, I like seeing other people's stuff, but it tends to, I feel it's a very disconnected way of interacting with people. It's just hearing about the wonderful things they did. It's a very incomplete picture and it feels very shallow mm-hmm. to me. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I don't know how to say things that are interesting to people without actually talking to them. So it always feels <laughs> like, you know, this is just garish self-promotion on my part. And I want to share the cool things I've done, but that's all I ever want to share. I don't want to share that I'm having a bad day or whatever. <laughs> and, and so it's very incomplete. It's like you're seeing, you know, this tiny piece of who I am because most of the time I'm trying to do other things than brag about what I've done, you know? <laughs> and there are well, some days yeah. when I find that if I post a, a flower from my garden, I get more interest in that than what my work is actually about. <laughs> yeah. I think we have, most people are interested in our life and I'm not as, I'm just more private than that. I'm a total. I, and I, I, I respect that. And I <laughs> share your point of view is that, they do not see the complete window. In fact, uh-huh. you know, I I doubt if many know that I have lupus. You know, yeah. it's just like it's not something I share with the public. Yeah, um, they don't yeah. understand it. So yeah, it's not front and center. Um, well, I want to. I'd love to like spend just a little time with Elena and Mercedes, just finding out what's going on with your businesses right now. I feel like this is like. I said it earlier, but drinking from the fire hose, this is a lot of great information, Karen. It's just super, super valuable to talk to somebody who's been there and done it when we're at the start of our journey, you know, so it's just going to make the trip a lot shorter in places where we want it to be shorter and we can linger in places where we want to explore more. Um, So thank you so much for that. 